Well, hello there. Uh, thanks for joining me on this Wednesday. Uh, I hope you had a great day. And uh, uh, this is just going to be a kind of a simple Q&A session. Um, I don't have anything like crazy special planned, but a few questions came in that I thought would be uh, beneficial for everyone to uh, hear my answers to. And I have some things I've assembled to show you. So uh, I thought you might uh, like that. Uh, we've got Novala in the house. Hey, Novala and JC. Hey, JC. Um, so I'm going to just go over these. They're not that many. I think four or five questions um, that came in that I thought were uh, pertinent. And uh, I've seen them many times. Uh, so I thought you'd like to know my answer to them. And if you have any other questions, uh, throw them in the chat and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can as two. So uh, let's get started. Um, let's see, I'll check the chat on and off throughout the uh, our little live here. Um, but the first question that came in, uh, I have my notes over here, is how do I finish the back of my paintings when I'm done with them, like uh, when I wanna sell them or ship them off or something? And there are a couple ways uh, that I like to finish off my paintings. Um, and I'll share those with you. I think uh, if it's a thin uh, three quarter inch canvas, like one of those cheaper canvases, uh, I think the best way to, to frame those or finish those paintings is to frame them. Um, it's an added expense, but uh, I think the uh, presentation of a framed painting is spectacular and far superior than any anything you could do with those thinner canvases on their own. So um, I've got a canvas or a frame right here. This is a, a floating frame. This is my favorite type of frame to use. Um, this style of frame uh, for framing um, three quarter inch, uh, the cheaper canvases. Uh, I got this one at blick.com and this is a nine by 12. This is actually, it's a very thick profile uh, for a floating frame. Um, it's a really beefy frame. Uh, this was about $18. So it's not super expensive, but um, the presentation you get is amazing. So uh, it's, it's a solid wood frame. You have to, and I'll show you what I would do on the back of this, but uh, the, I'll just show you what a nine by 12 painting would look like in here. So here is a, this is the nine by 12 that we actually put the varnish on, the Liquitex varnish. Um, so it turned out really nice. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice painting. I'm just looking at the sheen here. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful painting. It's on that thin three quarter inch thick canvas. Um, and by itself, it's nice. But if you were to put that in a frame and then, you know, show something this, I mean, this is like night and day, a million times better. Um, and it automatically would make this painting worth a whole lot more, you know, in my estimation, just because it's framed. <clears throat> so framing can really uh, make a painting look amazing. So uh, this is uh, one version of that frame. Here's a uh, kind of a thinner, this is a simpler floating frame. Uh, and here's another painting. This is a just a yellow and purple painting that's been finished. Um, and they make these frames. You can find something like this on uh, Jerry's Artorama, uh, has a frame line called Creative Mark. And they're also relatively affordable frames. Um, this is a 12 by 12. And on the back, this is finished all the way on the back. So on the back of something like this, I would uh, put like a black or a colored uh, paper on the, on the rear of the frame, I've got um, little bumpers here that go on the wall. And any kind of smaller sized painting, I just use like an alligator hook, um, something like this that would just hang on the wall. Um, this is, you don't need the wire. Uh, I'll show you that too, but you don't have to ha like wire these up. Um, just a small hook like this is, is all you need for a smaller size frame like that. So uh, this is my favorite preferred way of finishing a uh, one of the thinner sized canvases. And I'll walk you through a couple of the supplies. Um, you could also uh, take and put the paper right on the back of 
your your canvas if you wanted to. I I you know I know that's done. Um, a lot of artists do that. It's a fine way to finish your paintings. Um, it's not my preferred way. Um, I think this is just a much more professional uh, way of presenting your artwork. Um, but that's just my opinion. Uh, if you use a gallery wrap canvas, um, there's no need to frame those. Uh, it's the thicker inch and a half canvas. It's a much beefier, substantial canvas. And it's it's already kind of a professional presentation. So you would just you just need to wire those up actually. I'll show or put the, the little clip on if it's a smaller size canvas. Um, that's what I would do, and that's how I finish my um, gallery wrap canvases. And uh, if I have my new panels that I'm working on, uh, those also don't need frames. Um, like this one right behind me, that's a, a cradled panel. Um, there's no need to frame that at all. It's already a finished, like professional quality uh, presentation. So I would just use a, a wire those up. And uh, to wire these up, um, I'll show you what I use. Uh, so here are some bumpers. Let me flip the camera. And uh, we've got more people in the in the audience. Welcome, everybody. Um, <clears throat> and uh, OK. Let's see, I, you know, just flip the camera over and I'll show you some of these other supplies I use for framing quickly. It's, I've got a mess down here. There's, this is something else and we've got our little frame here. But uh, these are uh, just little rubber bumpers that I put on the back of my uh, frame or on the back of my uh, cradle panel or gallery wrap canvas, just to keep it away from the wall. Um, it just kind of protects the wall from the canvas scraping against it. Um, and then to put, to put the paper on the back of your canvas, uh, I wouldn't put paper on the back of my gallery wrap um, canvases or on my cradle panels, really. Um, I just think the, the, the back of those are, are fine the way they are. Um, but if you wanted to put this on the back of your actual canvas, uh, what I would use is a double-sided tape like this. And this is, happens to be like a scotch, uh, scotch double-sided tape. And there's a gun that I use um, to apply this. Um, but I, I haven't used this in a while. So um, the gun is buried somewhere in a box. Uh, I haven't pulled it out yet, so I couldn't find it. But uh, there's, a, there's a gun that this goes in. And uh, so you'd run this around your canvas or frame and then you'd apply the paper and then you take a, a razor and then just slice uh, the paper off. And then to uh, wire your frames up, again, you could just use a, a simple, um, this is a, a simple hook like this, a simple uh, hanger is fine. Anything smaller than like a 16 by 20, I'd probably use a hanger like this. Anything above like a 16, 20, 16 by 20 or larger, I'd probably uh, use a uh, hanging wire or picture framing wire. And this is the wire I like. Um, this is kind of a all around number four wire. Um, and this has a uh, plastic coating on it, which is really nice. It makes it a whole lot easier to use. And uh, a lot of the wires you'll find on Amazon or if you go to Michael's, they do not have a coating like this. It's just a bare wire. I hate using that stuff. Um, this is the, what I really like. Um, it's a tiny bit more expensive, but um, well worth it in my opinion. So, and it even shows you how to wire up, um, how to put the wire, like a one, two, three, four steps into properly wiring uh, your picture frame. And here's uh, what I like to use as far as uh, the uh, hooks go. I like to use these. Um, this is like a, it's a picture frame hook. So this would go on the side. I'll show you this. So if this is the top of our, our frame or canvas, these would go on the side, just like this. And then the wire goes across about a third of the way down the, uh, the frame, a, a third of the way down. So, so here's my frame. So they're about a quarter to a third of the way down. And when you wire these up, you want to keep the wire uh, rather loose. Uh, 
You don't want it super tight. Uh, you like to have like a bow in it and it just makes it easier uh, to hang and adjust the picture on the wall. So I would have my wire probably about like, about like this. So I know that's a terrible demonstration of wiring up a, a picture. If there's, if you'd like to see me actually do that sometime, I could, um, I could do that and uh, actually show you the proper way to wire up a, a picture. But uh, I don't want to get into that um, today. So anyway, that's how I would finish the, uh, the back of a frame or a canvas. And let me flip back here quickly. So uh, I have actually most of the stuff I got on Amazon. So I put a lot of this. There's a section in my Amazon page where you could go check this stuff out and just to reference it and see what I use um, if, if you're interested in um, these supplies. So it's an easy way to find them uh, just by going to my Amazon page. I'll put the link in the chat in a little while. Um, so those are what I use. That's how I frame up my paintings. So let me check the uh, comments and see if there's any questions that came in. And JC asked, um, yes, uh, we, you can find those on Amazon here. Let me put the, uh, um, let me put the link just a second here. Uh, I'll put it in the comments just so I don't forget. And uh, I have a, a picture framing section uh, on my page so you could find this stuff. And I think I put the gun in there too, the, uh, the tape gun that I use. Um, sorry, I couldn't show you that. Um, it's like a scotch, kind of a yellow tape gun. It's really handy for putting paper on the backs of your frames. So, um, and uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Sumera said that the, like the uh, box frames or the gallery wrap frames are great and you don't have to frame them, which is true. Um, that's a huge advantage to using the gallery uh, profile canvases and, and they just look very nice. They're very professional. Um, so yeah, and then you wouldn't have to frame them at all. So framing is a, you know, it's an added expense, but it can really um, propel your artwork and make it look a whole lot more expensive and more professional. Um, and Novala asks, will you show us a cloud pour? Uh, I will show you a cloud pour um, at some point. Uh, I'm working on a cloud pour workaround. Um, the cloud pour is a tricky technique, um, both to do and uh, because you require special ingredients, which are a little difficult to find sometimes. Um, the traditional cloud pour um, uh, paint that you use is the DecoArt Satin Enamel. I actually have some right here. Uh, the DecoArt Satin Enamel paint. Um, this is how you get the beautiful cloud, uh, the clouds to form, but this is very hard to find now. Um, uh, I don't know if, if DecoArt is making any more of this, but I uh, used to be able to find this at Michael's all the time or Hobby Lobby. It's very difficult to find there. Um, it's hard to find online. Um, so that causes a big problem uh, in doing that technique just because it's hard to find uh, the proper ingredients. There are some other paints that will kind of do the same thing, but in my opinion, not as well. Um, you can get some satin enamel paints from Home Depot, like Bear makes one. I've used that many times. I'm just not happy with it. Um, it does kind of the cloud effect somewhat, but uh, it's, it's not as good. But uh, worst case, um, I would use that. Uh, and, and we'll see, and I'm, I'm testing out something else that I found. It's promising, but I have to uh, do a little more experimenting with it. So, and it should be readily available, um, but give me a little bit of time and I'll get back to you on the cloud pour um, experiments. So I uh, hope that, I sorry, you know, hope that answers the question and creates some suspense. So, but, uh, but that's a good question, Navala. And I will get, I will definitely do it at some point, uh, hopefully soon. So how about the frames? Um, JC says, how about the frames on Amazon? Uh, you can get some frames, the floating frames on Amazon. I put a couple in my framing page. 
um, just to give you an idea of what they look like. So you can maybe find them uh, more affordably on other sites. Um, Amazon is really hit and miss with uh, like picture frames. Um, uh, sometimes they have them, sometimes they don't. Uh, Blick is a great place, a great resource to find them. Uh, Jerry's Artorama is a really good place to find them. Uh, they're usually more affordable. You can buy them kind of in bulk if you need to on those sites and get a little bit better deal. Um, so yeah, I'll, but I put a few on there just so you can see what they look like, get an idea of the pricing, um, and uh, maybe go do some more searching if you wanted to check into framing. Uh, good question though. Um, hello, Renate, glad you could join us. Uh, Renate is on my YouTube channel a lot. He leaves fantastic comments. He's from Germany. So um, thank you for joining us, Renate. And uh, okay, so no other questions right now, but if you have any other questions, throw them in the chat and we'll answer them as I go along here. So the second question that came in uh, that I thought would be uh, beneficial to share is uh, what mediums can I use besides Floetrol? I'm having a problem finding Floetrol. Uh, and so I thought this would be a good opportunity to just talk about the different mediums that I use and recommend uh, aside from Floetrol, because I know Floetrol um, can be hard to find if you're outside the US. Um, so I'll walk you through a couple of the different uh, pouring mediums that you can get. Um, the closest thing to Floetrol that's not Floetrol is this stuff, which is called Oatrol. Um, you can buy this online in the US. I think this is a Canadian company. So I know that in, in Canada, they use this uh, quite often. So I think it's fairly readily available in Canada and other parts of uh, the UK, I think. Um, don't quote me on that. I'm not exactly sure. But, um, but it's, it's pretty similar to Floetrol. I prefer Floetrol. I've used this um, several times, um, a handful of times. I like the results. It's just not quite as, I don't get quite as many cells that I'm used to with uh, Floetrol, but maybe I just need to um, uh, play with it a little more, maybe alter the formula a tiny bit. Uh, but I think it's important to, um, to use other pouring mediums and because, you know, not everyone's in the U.S. and can get uh, Floetrol uh, like we can here. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on my Oatrol um, uh, practice, but this is a good one. If you can't get Floetrol, this is a, a pretty darn close to Floetrol. Um, and then the next one is, I've talked about many times. Do I have it here? I don't know. I think I forgot to pull it out. Um, I put it away, but that is um, just the Elmer's glue, the Elmer's glue all. It's, it's, it's relatively affordable. It's pretty easy to find. Um, it's not quite like Floetrol. You get kind of different effects. Uh, you won't get all the cells like Floetrol will create, um, but it's close and you can use silicone in it. And that's a kind of a different technique uh, using the silicone oil in the glue. I like that. I like those types of cells. They're different looking than the Floetrol cells. But if you if you can't find anything else, and you can but you can find the white glue, um, that is a good pouring medium to go with. Another one that I've used is, and that I like a lot is uh, Artist Loft pouring medium. Um, this is a good one. I've also used DecoArt, the DecoArt pouring medium. I'm not as thrilled with the DecoArt, but I think I'm going to give it another shot. I've done I don't know a handful of paintings with the DecoArt pouring medium. Uh, I think my I think my expectations actually were a little bit too high for using these types of pouring mediums, um, but you'll get different effects. These do not act like Floetrol does. Um, you do not get the cells that you get with the Floetrol with these types of pouring mediums. Your uh, paints are much more uh, solid colors. They're still beautiful. They're great for ring pours. Um, because they minimize cells and, you know, in, gen in general ring pours, you don't want a ton of cells, um, but you just get a different look. And, um, but, but these are great to work with. Um, you could use these for Dutch pours as well. When you do not want all the cells that like Floetrol 
generates with Dutch pours. So these are uh, handy pouring mediums to use. They're relatively affordable. Uh, they're more expensive than the Floetrol and the Elmer's glue, but not as expensive as a couple other ones that I'll be showing you in a second. So these are great pouring mediums to use. Um, I like them a lot. The next up is, um, this is a relatively new one that I've been using. It's Sargent's Pouring Medium. I got this on Amazon. Um, it's a pretty inexpensive pouring medium. I'd say, I'd actually say these two are a little higher quality than the Sargent's or maybe a lot higher quality, but um, it is more, this is a more fluid uh, pouring medium than, than these two. Um, and it is a little bit more affordable. So it's a good one to try out, especially if you're newer and you um, can't get the flow trawl or the glue or other things. You could probably find this on Amazon um, and give this a shot. It's I think you get more bang for your buck with this type of a pouring medium. I think this costs about $10. Don't quote me on that. Um, I think it was about $10. But, but this, like this is about half the size, is about... $15, I think. So this is a little more affordable. Um, I haven't worked with this a ton. I've just gotten it for another um, experiment I've been, I've been doing. But so far, I like it okay. It works pretty good. So that is um, Sargent Pouring Medium. Uh, the next two are the good ones and the most expensive ones, which are the Golden Pouring Medium. And my, my favorite of all is the Liquitex pouring medium. Um, these are great. They are wonderful. Um, the Liquitex can generate cells when you use it with the Floetrol, but if you use these just by themselves, again, they're very similar to these two. They don't like generate cells on their own. Uh, in order to do that, we need to uh, add something else. But uh, the reason you're using these in general is if you really don't want cells. So these are great to use for um, uh, Dutch pours and swipes and things like that. Um, and, you know, in swipes, you can get a lot of cells because we're using a swiping tool and um, that's creating friction and the friction is what can cause the cells to, to burst forth. So, um, but these are great pouring mediums. They are more expensive. Uh, the golden pouring medium is also the same as the GAC um, 800. So it's basically, it's the same formula. It's just a different name. I think they, they renamed it to the golden uh, pouring medium now. Um, so the GAC 800 golden pouring medium, the same thing. Um, but these are great. So those are um, several different pouring mediums you can use if you can't find uh, the Floetrol. I think the Floetrol is still my favorite um, pouring medium. And, you know, technically it's not a pouring medium. It's a, you know, a paint conditioner. Um, these are pouring mediums because they have, um, acrylic binders in them. They're, they're made with acrylic. This is the, like the guts of acrylic paint is what these types of pouring mediums are, acrylic binders. So, uh, technically Floetrol isn't a pouring medium, but that's the way we use it. It's an additive we add to our paints to thin them out. Um, so I call it a pouring medium, you know, but that's a technicality. Anyway, so that is, uh, answers the question about some pouring mediums. Let me check and see if we got any uh, other questions about that. Um, just scrolling up here. And uh, Jerry asks a great question, and I've seen this many times. What is the difference between USA Floetrol and Australian Floetrol? That is a fantastic question. Um, I was gonna get into that down the line a little bit in another question, but I just so happen to have the Australian flow trial right here. Um, the difference between the two, uh, this is uh, a little bit thinner consistency than um, the USA flow trial. So this is the USA flow trial, this is the Australian flow trial. Over here in America, uh, the USA, this is about 10 bucks, give or take, for a quart. Um, oh, and this is 50 bucks over here in the USA. So the big difference is this is way more expensive to get. 
um, for us in the U.S. in Australia, it's um, you know obviously not as hard to get and hard to find, so it's probably it's cheaper. But um, the difference, as far as what paint pouring, uh, where paint pouring is concerned, um, this is typically used for the bloom technique um, to create what is known as cell activator or CA for short. Um, and basically, the, uh, Shelley's, uh, Shelley came up with this terminology. Shelley uses this all the time. That's why it became so popular because she developed the blooms. The blooms are amazing. Um, she taught her uh, technique in a course, which I bought. Um, it's fantastic. Um, but her original formula, uh, the cell activator or CA, is uh, Australian Floetrol and uh, Amsterdam paint, uh, specifically titanium white or carbon black. I don't have any carbon black um, anymore. I used it. I don't have any, I haven't ordered anymore. But um, these two are what create the cells in blooms. Um, bloom technique is a complicated technique. Um, I don't want to get into the entire process, but the difference between um, uh, or, or why we use the Floetrol in the cell activator with the blooms is because all the other paints do not have Floetrol in them. So uh, it, they're a little bit like oil and water. Uh, when we put the cell activator on top of these other paints and below it, again, we're using... Um, uh, friction, where so we're blowing the Floetrol interacting with the other paints that do not have the Floetrol in them creates all these amazing cells. Um, that's the broad, you know, general, um, uh, uh, pr you know, process. You know, that's um, very simplified. So, but uh, but the difference between um, the Australian Floetrol this works much better than the uh, U.S. Floetrol for blooms, for some reason. Uh, it's the formulation, it's the uh, whatever is in here is a little bit different than what's in here. So it's is highly sought after for the blooms. Um, uh, but for regular painting or regular paint pouring, the other, the normal techniques we use all the time, the flip cups and ring pours, uh, swipes and uh, kiss pours and floating cups and all of these things, um, I would not use the Australian Floetrol. I would only use this really with the bloom technique, um, at least for us in the US, just because it's so expensive. Um, the, uh, the US Floetrol is fine for all these other techniques. So you hear, you see Australian Floetrol talked about all the time. Uh, and the reason is it's because of the bloom technique. And uh, it's really, uh, it's it's needed and or it's not totally needed for that technique. You can use other things for blooms, but it's very sought after for that specific technique. So hopefully that answers um, your question. Um, if you don't need, if you're not interested in blooms right now, um, blooms are expen an expensive technique because you need a lot of different ingredients. Um, if you're just getting started, I would stay away from the blooms uh, until you're more comfortable with some of the other techniques. And then you can dive into the blooms and all of the complexity um, that they entail. So uh, I would stay away from the Australian Floetrol until you're ready to invest in um, the stuff you need for blooms, if that makes any sense. I hope so. If you have any other questions, please throw them in the comments and I will uh, uh, try to answer them. And uh, okay, let me... Look down here. Um, Donna says, the deco art and artist loft are thicker. I need to try the sergeant. Yeah, the uh, uh, these two, let me move this out of the way. Uh, these two um, are very similar. They're very similar in consistency. Um, these are actually very similar to the Liquitex consistency. The Liquitex might be a tiny bit thinner, but the Sargent is quite a bit thinner. I mean, this is very watery. So um, the formulas change a little bit when you're using all these different for all these different pouring mediums. So, but that is a, a discussion for another time. So I just wanted to show you kind of the, the ones that I use and 
would recommend. So, and okay, what else do we have? Um, um, Michelle asked, asked a question. <clears throat> there are several Liquitex pouring mediums. What's the difference and which is best? Well, that's not exactly uh, accurate, Michelle. There is, there's really one Liquitex pouring medium, which is this one here, which says pouring medium. It's the gray label. There are many Liquitex mediums out there. Um, and there is a gloss medium. There is a uh, matte medium. There is a medium and varnish. Um, there are many, many Liquitex mediums, which is, and a medium is basically a blanket term for anything with a lot of acrylic binder, made with acrylic binder, and that you add to your paints. Um, that's what a medium is. It's just something you add to your paints. Um, but they only have one pouring medium, which is uh, the Liquitex pouring medium. So I know that can be confusing because there's all these different things that say medium. Um, but uh, there is only one uh, pouring medium. So there are, well, I'll take that back. There is also an iridescent pouring medium from Liquitex. Um, so there are actually two. Sorry about that. I'm totally confusing you. But there is a, this is the standard pouring medium. And then they have an iridescent pouring medium, which just has like sparkly stuff in it. Um, I don't use that as much. Um, this is kind of my go-to one from Liquitex. So yeah, don't get confused by all of the different types of, of mediums there are. Um, and there are also a whole range of um, uh, thicknesses. So they have really stiff mediums, which would not work at all for paint pouring. Um, and those are also known as gels. So, but they're all kind of, they're all under the blanket of mediums. So there is gel medium, there is, um, uh, uh, and then there is like a stiff medium, a medium, uh, medium thickness medium, and then a soft medium, which is uh, more like uh, whipping cream. So there are all these different products and it is very confusing. So um, I hope that makes sense. Um, when you're looking for the Liquitex pouring medium, look for the one with the gray label on it. Um, that says pouring medium um, and not like the red labels. Those are varnishes uh, from Liquitex. The blue labels are other types of mediums. Um, and those are like the uh, matte medium and gloss medium um, and uh, medium and varnish. So um, I know that's very confusing. This is the one I recommend the, and works the best for me though. The um, actual pouring medium with the gray label. I hope that makes sense. Okay. And Noel says Floetrol and glue together. You can do that. Um, I know a lot of artists do that. They have, a, there's a lot of different formulas for um, all kinds of different pouring concoctions. Uh, I personally don't like glue and uh, Floetrol together. Uh, I just don't see the benefit from it. Uh, I've tried many paintings with the combination. Um, I've done more Floetrol and less glue, more glue and less Floetrol. Um, I just never really loved the results I got. Uh, so I just kind of stick with either one or the other. And I use each of them for a different type of technique. So Floetrol is my preferred one. That's the one I use most often. But I do like the glue when I'm using the silicone and creating the, the really beautiful roundish cells. So, um, but yes, if you want to experiment, by all means, um, I know a lot of people use a combination of both. Um, let's see. And Donna has a couple questions. Um, Jerry has another question about the, um, the Liquitex medium. If you're, you, if you're going to use a Liquitex gloss medium or satin medium, in what case would you use it? Uh, I personally uh, wouldn't use the gloss or the satin medium. I stick to the pouring medium. Um, this is the one that I like the best. Um, you can get 
similar results from the other two. Um, the pricing is about the same, I think. I don't think you're going to really save any money, really, with the different ones. Um, they're, but they're all meant for different things. Um, you know, the gloss medium, uh, and they're meant for all different types of painting, you know. They're not designed specifically for paint pouring. Like nothing really is designed, well, now it is. Um, but all the Liquitex products, none of that was really designed for uh, paint pouring. Even this stuff, the pouring medium, was not really meant for like actual paint pouring in mind. It was, you know, for splashing paint around, just making it really fluid. Uh, and then we just kind of took it over and use it for paint pouring now. Um, so I would, I really, uh, would I, I really don't use the other types of Liquitex mediums, um, like the gloss or the satin. I really only use the the um, the pouring medium one. That one is the one that I I like the best. Using this primarily in conjunction with the Floetrol, but you could use it by itself too. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. But you can I mean you can also always experiment with all the other types of mediums if you want to. The, um, the, uh, the whole goal really with these pouring mediums, all of these mediums that I just talked about is just to get our paints thinner um, without adding like a ton of water. Um, that's really the basis of this whole discussion. So I guess that's a good thing to talk about. Like why do we need any of these mediums, right? Um, the whole point of the Floetrol and um, all these pouring mediums is to thin our paints to get them into a uh, pouring consistency, a pouring uh, fluid fluid enough to pour um, without using a ton of water. Now, I know that um, you can use just water by itself. Um, you know, Rinske and Molly and a lot of other artists do that uh, to get the paints to pouring consistency. The rub is you have to use higher quality paints to do that. Otherwise, uh, all that water in cheaper paints like the um, like the Master's Touch or Artist Loft paints, um, they do not have these are not high enough quality pigments um, in these like cheaper versions. Uh, so all that water to get our paints fluid enough is going to break down. Um, it's going to break down the bonds between the pigments and the uh, acrylic binders in here. So we get that graininess um, that we don't like to see. Um, so that's why we want to use something else like this uh, to help get it fluid enough. Um, and by Floetrol, I use a lot of Floetrol because the Floetrol helps generate the amazing effects in cells. So that is kind of the whole basis for all these things. Um, and you can use just water. If you get higher quality paints, um, like Liquitex, like the Liquitex Basics, these are high quality. Uh, Nova Color paints are very high quality. Golden paints are high quality. Uh, you can just add water. I mean, also Amsterdam paints are higher quality. You can use just water to get your paints thinner. The problem with that, in my opinion, is you're using a ton more paint now. Um, Whereas, so you maybe have to use this whole tube of Liquitex to get, you know, five ounces of, of pourable paint. Whereas if you use the Floetrol or the other pouring mediums, you could use um, half or a third of the tube to get the same amount of paint. So these are also um, what are known as extenders. So we're extending the volume of material we get out of uh, our paints without using all paint, if that makes sense. Um, so there are multiple reasons why we're using all these uh, pouring mediums and Floetrol and all that stuff. You can use just the water, but now you're using way more paint, which is, uh, which is totally fine, but it's just gonna cost more money. So it's just, uh, it's, a ba it's a balancing act between, um, you know, your supplies and, and how much, um, you know, do you care or do you not care about the money or, um, uh, you want just more pigments and stuff and you just want to use water, um, you can definitely use just the higher quality paints. But then that, on the other hand, that's more expensive. So then we could use things like this um, and Floetrol and stuff for the lower quality paints to make them, uh, to give us more volume. 
So hopefully that makes sense. I know that's a big, long, rambling uh, talk about pouring mediums and stuff. So I'll, I'll get off that now. So, um, and uh, so Michelle says, uh, uh, no problem, Michelle, by the way. And uh, Mina, yeah, Mina uses all kinds of stuff. So does like Molly, you, they use all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, no, I'm, I'm sure she uses uh, varnish in her paintings, um, which is completely fine. She has a you know, specific formula for that. Um, I like to keep things as simple as possible in my paintings until I need to make them more complex. So my formulas, I always go with as few things as possible until I need to add something to get a specific result um, that I'm looking for. So I know Mina puts like varnish in. I'm sure she does that um, in, you know, my opinion is so she can get a shinier finish to her paintings um, without having to varnish them. So they dry shinier, which is a good, a good thing to do. Um, you know, if you want to, um, if you just want a shinier dry painting without having to varnish or, or put a top coat on. Um, so that is the reasoning for that. Um, but is it's, it will thin the paints down, but it's not necessarily a pouring medium. I just wanted to make this, the distinction between the two. There are all these different mediums, um, you know, that you can use as pouring mediums. Um, but Liquitex only really does make the one that they name pouring medium. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't want to confuse anyone further <laughs> with all this talk. So, um, so hopefully that makes sense. If, if not, let me know, please. Um, but, but yeah, thanks for mentioning that, that in uh, Mina and the varnish though. That is a solid point. And, uh, so Navala says she has a couple gallons of gloss varnish. I would go ahead and use it, you know, use it up. Um, don't be afraid to use any of these things. Um, the difference between like the pouring medium and the gloss varnish is probably not going to be that dramatic. Um, it will probably be fairly similar um, in, you know, the results you get. So give it a try. You know, don't be afraid of experimenting with any of these products. So then there is no white, one right formula. Um, I have my formulas um, that I like, but there are many other formulas that other artists like. Uh, mine are just, um, I like them because I get good results with them, um, but they're not the best or perfect formulas. So don't, don't take anything that I'm saying as the absolute um, only way to do it. There are countless ways to do anything. So, um, Please don't take that as like my way or the highway. So, uh, okay. So, and someone else asks, now that I've opened up a can of worms, see? Um, I've used Liquitex pouring medium as a varnish for a couple of my paintings. Is that a bad idea? Um, it's not ideal um, just because it's not, you know, this stuff is really not designed as a picture varnish. Um, if it worked for you, then that's great. Um, the problem is, the reason I don't like it is they do make a varnish that's, you know, similar cost that is designed as a varnish, which has uh, UV inhibitors in it. Um, and it um, is specifically for that purpose. So, um, but there's nothing wrong with using um, like this as a, a varnish if it works for you. Um, I personally wouldn't use it. Uh, I would personally, I like the Liquitex uh, varnish um, a lot. So I would use that. Um, hopefully that makes sense though. Um, but, uh, but don't, don't like be afraid that you ruined your paintings or anything. So, and you could always, if you want to put the Liquitex varnish right over the top of your paintings that you finish with this, this actually would act as a um, isolation coat in a way. Um, so so don't, don't be afraid of that at all. Uh, okay, okay. I'm so happy to hear that, Michelle. Michelle is happy with all my babbling. So, um, so that's great. I'm glad it's making a little more sense. So, 
Um, Donna asked a good question. Is there any products to stay away from because they cause cracking? Um, that is a great question. Um, the ones that come to mind right off the top of my head, um, first one is um, the Apple Barrel White Paint. The Apple Barrel White Craft Paint is notorious for cracking. So I would stay away from that one. Um, you know, that's a, that's a paint, you know, product. As far as additives go, um, I would, I don't really have anything that specifically sticks out to me other than um, I would be leery of adding, um, uh, what's it called? What's it called? Things that are not made by a, a paint company, um, like, a, like an art company, like Liquitex or Golden. See, all of these supplies, all of these like pouring mediums and these pouring mediums and all of these other, all those other um, varnishes and mediums we talked about, the gels and all that stuff, uh, they have a lot of acrylic binders in them, which means that they're flexible when they dry. Um, anything that dries hard um, can cause cracks. So if you're putting in um, like a polyurethane, let's say like the polyacrylic, um, anything that dries hard can crack on a canvas, which is a soft surface. So I would be leery of using things like polyacrylic um, in your paint mixes um, if you're using a lot of it, like a little bit, maybe not would wouldn't maybe not be a big deal. Um, but other than that, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that is like notorious for cracking. So, but just but just um, keep that in mind. All of these types of things, like the Liquitex, the Golden, anything that has um, like the Sargent, even uh, when those are dry, they're flexible. So when you're putting those on a soft surface like a canvas, um, you want those to be flexible um, instead of uh, brittle or, or rigid. Now, if you're using like a panel or a cradle panel like I'm using, then you have a whole lot more leeway because that, sur that substrate is not going to be moving around or, or flexing. So then you have a lot more, um, it can be a lot safer with what you use in your paints and stuff and to avoid cracking. I hope that makes sense. But that's a great question. Um, and... Uh, Novella asks, is pre-stain a wood conditioner? Um, pre-stain, it's, I mean, it is a, it's a product for woodworking, uh, for finishing wood. And uh, I've experimented with the pre-stain. Um, it can get, it can help generate lots of cells. Um, it's an oil-based product, um, I believe. So I believe it is, maybe it's not, I can't remember. Um, I'd have to look at the, the container, but I've used it. I have it. It's smelly. Um, it's 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 not a it's not a paint conditioner. Um, um, I, I think I'm I I think I missed the point of your question. Is it? Uh, um, can you use it as a like? Why do people use the wood conditioner in the first place? Um, some of them use it. They say if you add the wood conditioner to the U.S. Floetrol, it'll make it a little more like the Australian Floetrol uh, with the bloom. Um, it can, it just, it definitely helps generate lots of cells, like little tiny cells, um, which is an interesting look. Um, I haven't used it a ton, um, but it is, it is an interesting uh, product to use. You don't use a lot of it. You think of the wood conditioner like you would think of silicone. Uh, you only use a couple drops in your colors. So you do not use a, a lot of it at all, just a just a couple drops. Um, but it is fun to play with if you want to. It is stinky though, so if that bothers you, um, you might want to think twice about that. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna go back here. See if there's any other questions I missed. Oh, right. No.
Okay. Um, okay, I'm just going back in, and Donna had some, some great questions. Um, so this one here, we're back to pouring mediums. Uh, with Liquitex and GAC 800, what are the ratios? <clears throat> well, there are, there are many different ratios you could use, um, and it really depends on what you're going after. Um, it depends on the technique. Uh, it depends on how fluid you need your paints to be. Um, so it depends on a lot. I can't give you just one ratio because there is no one ratio. Um, I'll give you the ratio that I use most often with the Liquitex pouring medium. And that is, I would use three parts Floetrol. So uh, three parts Floetrol, two parts Liquitex, and then three parts paint. And then uh, whatever amount of water you need to get to the right consistency. And that would be for uh, flip cups and ring pours. And uh, I use that most often for my floating cup pours and open cups. <clears throat> um, the two together, the Liquitex and the Floetrol, create an amazing combination of cells, which I love. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, all the lines are much cleaner and sharper. Um, so I just love using that formula. So that's one formula. Now, if you don't want to use any Floetrol at all, then, and you're, you're just using Liquitex, let's say for um, the Dutch pour, for instance, you're going to try that. I would probably use, well, it depends. It also depends on the paint now. So it depends on uh, the paint you're using, but I'd probably go one to one. So one part of this, one part paint um, to start with, and then use um, uh, water to get to the right consistency. You could also try uh, two parts paint to one part Liquitex. Uh, so that's a little less Liquitex, a little more paint, and then, um, now we're talking a little bit more like using just the paint and water by itself. If you use one part Liquitex, two parts paint, you can add a whole lot more water now because you have all this extra uh, acrylic binder in there. Uh, so you could use that with the cheaper paints and it's not going to break down, the water won't break down the paint, um, the, uh, the pigments and get that you know grainy granular look. So that would be a, a good ratio to use for things like a Dutch pour, um, or when you want the paints thinner, like that. Hopefully that answers your question. That's a good one. And let's see. Yeah, Donna has another question. This is back to hang in your paintings. Um, how do you know where to hang your hangers on a piece as people may hang them or see them in a different way? This is a great question. And Donna's referring to... Um, the orientation of your painting. And um, now this is something that everyone has a different opinion on. I'll talk about this for just a second. Um, but, because uh, I mean, these are abstract paintings. They can be turned any which way. It's not like a portrait or a landscape, which has one, uh, you know, one way to hang on the wall. You know, it's, if it's a portrait, it's got a head, it's, that's the top, you know, the, the body is the bottom or the neck is the bottom, that's it. If it's a landscape, sky is the top, ground is the bottom. Um, so, no, that's easy. But with abstract artwork, um, things get a little different, a little more difficult. Now, there are a couple ways of dealing with this. My preferred way, you're the artist, I'm the artist. Um, I get to determine which way I think the painting looks best. Um, that is the way I feel about it. Um, so I will look at it. I'll, you know, when I'm done with the painting, I'll put it on the wall, step back, turn it, uh, look at it again, turn it again. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, my feeling is as the artist, it's our res responsibility to determine which way the painting looks best and present that to you know the audience or a customer. Um, not everyone feels that way, which I totally understand. Um, some people, some artists want, you know, think the customer would like to give the customer the um, opportunity to select which uh, uh, orientation they think looks best, which is completely fine. There's no right or wrong 
um, in this discussion. But um, my feeling is it's our responsibility to, we created it. We get to decide which way we think it looks best. So, um, and then to finalize that, you can sign your, you sign your piece. Like on this painting, um, my signature is right here. So right there, now you know this is the way it, it hangs on the wall. If they don't like it, well, they don't have to buy it. So um, that is my, um, that is my um, feeling on you know, abstracts and orientation and allowing people to um, pick how it looks. Now, if you're working with, on, as a commission with someone, then it's a little different story. They have a much more personal interest in it. Um, then you can get their feedback, you know, things, you know, nothing has to be set in stone. There's no one way you have to do everything. Um, so you can be flexible with this. Maybe um, there's an artist that I love. His name is David Kessler. He's an abstract painter. Sometimes he can't decide if he likes um, a painting more horizontal format or vertical format. Um, he likes it both ways. So he'll sign his name in the corner diagonally. So you could hang it either way. Um, and so that gives the customer two choices. They could hang it horizontally or vertically. Um, so there's no right way or wrong way. Um, everyone has a different opinion uh, and they're all valid. Um, but uh, I hope that gives you something to think about. Um, but as the, you know, the way I feel about it is it's, um, I created it. I get to decide the way I think it looks best. And um, that's it, you know, that's the final say. Um, and sometimes, you know, if it's, if I don't know, if it's like, I, you know, I will do what David does. I'll sign it horizontal in the corner, or I will sign the side uh, and then give, you know, you'd have a couple choices, but um, so there's no right way or wrong way. Um, do whatever way you're, you feels comfortable for you. Um, and then that will be the right way for you. Hope that makes sense. Um, that was a little ranty and, and, you know, oops, sorry. That was a little ranty and um, preachy, but sorry about that. Okay, let's see what else we got down here. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, hey, Angela's in the house. Hey, Angela. And uh, I watched, uh, Jerry says she's had a couple professional artist classes that I took and they said that water can cause cracking. Um, yes, that's true. Um, water can cause cracking if you use uh, too much water uh, in, you know, because now we're back to binders again. So acrylic binders. So if there's uh, usually, and this all has to do with the quality of the paints as well. So um, like for gold, golden paints, you know, the top of the line, the best there is. Um, you could use about 30% water in those paints. But those paints are professional grade quality. They've got a lot of pigments and a lot of binders in them. Um, so you can get away with more with uh, golden paints. Um, um, the lower quality paints, um, you, I would stay away from that much. And I would, I would add a pouring medium. So... Um, I would say maybe add, you know, you could have two parts paint, one part, you know, Liquitex pouring medium or another pouring medium. Uh, and then you could add maybe 25% water, which is plenty to get your paints to the proper consistency. It really doesn't take that much water um, to get the paints really fluid. So um, you should be fine. And I've done, uh, at this point, um, hundreds and hundreds, if not over a thousand paintings. Um, I've never had one crack, you know, that I used, um, you know, kind of medium grade paints, like the student grade, like uh, uh, Liquitex and Artist Loft, Master's Touch. Um, I have had cracking in a couple of uh, the glue um, and craft paint paintings, but, you know, that's to be expected kind of because that's much lower quality paint. Um, you're using glue, which is kind of you know, that's unconventional. It's not an artist quality material. Um, so, um, and there's kind of like a, there's kind of like an old wives tale or like a rumor out there that some acrylic painters have that you should never use water with your acrylic paints. 
Like, like if you put a drop of water in your acrylic paints, oh my gosh, you know, you're going to dilute the, the, the uh, pigments and uh, they're not, they're not going to stick together. That's just not true at all. So um, if you, you've heard that, like you can't add any water to your acrylics, don't believe that it's not true. So that is, that floats around out there. That's like a, a rumor. Um, and I know a couple like very well-known, um, very famous acrylic painters who believe that. I don't know where they got that from, but it's just not true. So um, you can add water. If you're worried about adding too much water, just use some, add some more, some pouring medium as well. Um, so, but that's a good question though. And uh, um, and then another one from Jerry, um, they said that over time, if you don't use professional paints, the white can turn yellow. Uh, is that true? It depends on the white. Um, it, it really depends on uh, the, the quality of the paints, like craft paints. I would not trust those over time. Those are not high quality um, at all, really. They're, I mean, they're craft paints. They're very um, inexpensive. The reason they're inexpensive is because they use uh, very little pigments and inexpensive pigments. So um, you just have to be aware of, of what you're using and what you're you know, creating your paintings for. Um, I have no problem using craft paints at all because you know, those types of paintings, um, they're just fun paintings. They might be practice paintings. Um, I typically would not sell those paintings, but they're fun for me to make. So um, just, you know, you have to know, you know, what you're, uh, there's no problem in using any of these, any of these paints or pouring mediums or anything um, with the right intention in mind. Now, if you're painting just to sell your work um, and you want to sell your work for substantial amount of money, then uh, I think you have a responsibility to use high quality um, paints, high quality pouring mediums, high quality substrates, like uh, high quality canvases or panels or things like that. So, um, because you want to be a professional. So, and professionals use professional quality materials. Um, so it just happens, it just all depends on what you uh, are painting for, the end goal for your paintings. Um, but, you know, white paint, you know, is, is the cheapest paint you can get really. So there's, there's, no, there's no problem really in using a higher quality paint. Um, Liquitex Basics, uh, that's a great paint. This is good stuff. Um, and I, I consider this uh, just under professional grade paint. So, you know, by all means use Liquitex Basics paints, Amsterdam paints, also very high quality. Um, Nova Color paints, I've talked about those before. Excellent quality paints. That's a that's a professional grade. That is um, on par with Golden, in my opinion. Um, you know, of course, Golden is the you know Ferrari of all paints of acrylic paints. So, but you know, you don't have to use Golden. Uh, don't feel like oh my gosh, I got to use Golden. Um, you don't have to. There are plenty of other uh, professional uh, grade paints out there. So, um, but yes, but but back to the white. You know, your original question. I would stay away from craft paints. I would stay away from um, like, a, like the Blick acrylic. Um, you can get those in like large jugs. Those are just kind of lower, like a lower quality student grade paint. I'd probably stay away from those. Um, but I would feel completely comfortable with Liquitex, Amsterdam, um, and even like the Flow acrylic we all use all the time. I feel comfortable with that. Titanium white is the pigment used in all those whites. It's pretty stable. Um, it depends on the binders they use in there, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be too concerned about that. And then over time is a very broad uh, statement. You know, does that mean a year or two years or a hundred years? Um, so, you know, depends. It depends. Um, so I hope that answers your question. That's a good one. Um, Uh, Angela has a question. Uh, she just completed a huge diptych, 36 by 48 for her church. That's fantastic. Wow, what a big painting. I want to resin it once it's dry, but afraid of puddling in such large pieces. Um, uh, you know, off topic, but I'll give you my suggestion. That is a, that is a big undertaking. Um, 
uh, that's a that is a very large painting. Uh, it's a commission piece. Um, if you do, if you are not comfortable with resin, um, I would be very worried about tackling that project right off the bat. Um, and the other thing is, if it's in a church, uh, where is it going to be hanging? Um, because if there's a lot of light coming in there, um, it's going to be very hard to see your painting um, through the resin because the resin has such amazing glare. Um, it could be just, you know, you might not be able to see it at all. So a lot of that, a lot of your, your decision has to do with um, where the painting is going to be hanging, under what type of lighting conditions, um, you know, is it going to be under direct light or artificial light? There's a lot of questions there I would have and want to ask, you know, have answered before I even uh, thought about resining. And if you do want to resin it, uh, what I would suggest, I know this, it was, it's going to take time and it's going to take money. I would probably create another similar size diptych as a test painting and resin that first. Um, and maybe even start with some smaller pieces to get comfortable using the resin. Resin is tricky. Um, and especially on a canvas, now you're even, you're, you're uh, bringing a, um, a soft substrate into the picture. Um, so what you'd probably want to do is tighten the canvas up, maybe spritz it with water, but also support the back of the canvas. Like, uh, if you got some big styrofoam sheets, like you can go to Home Depot and they have insulation, like one inch and, and thicker um, insulating like styrofoam sheets. You want to cut that to, to fit it in the back of your canvas to stiffen it up before you put any resin on there. And um, you might want to do that also if you're even going to just put a, a brush on varnish because pooling can also happen with a, with a brush on varnish. So um, there's a lot to think about in that one. Angela. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're uncomfortable with resin, I'd be very cautious because resin can go bad really fast. And once it's on there, it's you're kind of screwed um, and it doesn't work. So I uh, hope that answers your question. Um, just be, be, be careful. And um, by all means, I would practice first. And because that is a that's a lot of resin also you're really going to have to do a lot of mixing um, and then you're going to have air bubble issues. Um, that's going to be, that's a tricky one. That's a big undertaking. So I don't want to scare you, um, but I just want to, you know, let you know that there's a lot involved in that project. So um, good luck with that one. Uh, all right. Let's see any other questions. Um, Donna's got a, um, uh, besides pouring mediums, if you had to make a list of things to add, what would it, would they be? I'm feeling like a scientist trying different things. Um, so we're talking about additives to your paints. Oh, there's a lot. Um, but I would keep it very simple, um, and try adding them one at a time. So, you know, uh, here's my very short list. Floetrol first. Um, second, Liquitex uh, pouring medium or gold and pouring medium. Um, if you combine with the Floetrol, um, then if you want to take things further, um, you could try. I mean, and I wouldn't put all these things in at once necessarily. Um, it all depends on kind of the, you know, what you're what you're after. Like, what's the end goal? What are you trying to achieve? Um, but other things you could add. Um, like silicone, obviously, you can add in very small amounts. Um, and all these things are going to create different effects. Um, if you don't want to use silicone, you could try the wood conditioner. That creates a whole lot of cells. That's a crazy uh, ingredient to try and use. Um, you might like it. All these things would be fun to experiment with. Um, if you don't want to use, you know, instead of the wood conditioner, you could try polycrylic and glue mix. Um, there's a, a great painter, um, Dan um, Hollins, or I can't think of his last name off the top of my head. Um, but Dan's got a great formula. He uses um, uh, glue. It's a glue water pouring medium, and he uses polycrylic in it. 
and silicone. He gets some amazing looking cells, um, but that's a you know very experimental. You know now we're using glue, we're using uh, silicone, we're using polyacrylic. You know that's a whole lot of wild stuff. So you know all kinds of things could happen over time with that kind of pouring medium. So, um, but that's a lot. You know there's a lot of different things. But those off the top of my head, I mean you could add varnish if you wanted a shinier um, painting. If you want a shiny painting, you could uh, use less Floetrol and use more um, like, like the Artist Loft pouring medium. That'll give you a much shinier uh, dried, dried result instead of the matte, kind of the typical matte paintings you get with uh, Floetrol. So there's a whole lot of things. Um, those are just kind of off the top of my head. Um, but uh, I hope, uh, hope that helps, Donna. That's a good question. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone asked, do I use milk? Um, do you use milk? And I think they're referring to milk paint. Um, uh, folk art had a line of uh, milk paints. You could get them at Michael's. Um, I use them and I have some still. Uh, I don't think, I think they discontinued making it. Um, it's a very cool product to use. I use the white and lighter colors and it creates uh, something very similar to the cloud effect. For cloud pours, the milk paint kind of takes over and creates these very interesting effects. Um, uh, it's it you don't need a lot of it. You have to dilute it with another white, like the Artist Loft white, because um, if you use all milk paint, it'll just take over your whole painting. Um, but it's a cool effect. I have used it. Uh, it's hard to find that stuff now, though. Um, and there are other milk paints out there, but I have not experimented with those. Uh, Donna has another question, which is a good one. Uh, when signing a piece, what do you use? Um, I personally like to use um, uh, high quality paint pens or like, you know, like a, I have a set of paint pens that I like to use. Um, you could paint with a brush, but that's very tedious. I've done that, you know, in my older days when I was doing other types of painting. I, I never like to do it. It's so, uh, you really have to have a skilled hand to, to paint, to sign with a brush. It's a, that's a whole art form in, it, in its own. Um, but a uh, paint pen is great. Um, I have a set of different colors. So I'll pick a color um, that kind of goes with the painting I'm using. So it's more of a subtle signature. I don't like a, like big garish signatures. Um, paint pens are great to use. And they have like Liquitex makes them. Uh, there's a lot of really like high quality ones that are you, they use the same kind of acrylics that are in your paints. So um, you don't have to worry about them like fading or, or doing anything weird to your painting. So they're high quality um, paint pens. That's a great question. I got to take a sip of water. Okay. Um, so uh, so um, here's another question about the milk paints. Um, how to mix them with the mediums. I would mix them, uh, when I use the milk paint, I would mix them about uh, no more than 50% milk paint, 50% artist loft. I probably even go um, um, more artist loft, like flow acrylic white than the milk paint because it can really take over. So maybe even like three parts um, artist loft to two parts milk paint. And then you could also add Floetrol. Um, so I'm just trying to think of what I would do. So here, to keep it simple, I would maybe start with this. And um, this isn't like the end all be all uh, formula, but I'd maybe go three parts Floetrol, if you're using Floetrol, uh, two parts milk paint, three parts uh, like artist loft, uh, acrylic paint, acrylic white and then maybe some water to get the right consistency. That's kind of what I would start with. Um, so, uh, hope that helps. I haven't, I don't have like a, like a milk paint recipe, like right off the top of my head. Um, it's been a little while since I've used that because it, it's hard to find it now. Uh, let's see. Um, here's a, okay. So we're going to talk about paint again quickly. Uh, what are good quality paints? Um, 
And so here's my rundown of, of paints that I like to use the most. Um, my favorite paint is probably Liquitex uh, Basics. I love this paint a lot. I use it all the time. It's probably my favorite. They have a great range of colors also. I also really like Amsterdam paints a lot. Um, uh, these are great paints. They're very comparable to like Liquitex. Um, I love to use like the Artist Loft paints. These are also really good paints. These are cheaper uh, by a little bit than like the Liquitex and the Amsterdam. These are great paints. You can get these at Michael's. Um, I also like uh, the Master's Touch paints are good too. These two paints are very similar in quality. Um, Master's Touch, you get these paints at Hobby Lobby um, in the US. They have some great paints and cool colors that I like. Uh, also, um, I like uh, DecoArt metallic paints. These are more of a craft paint now. These are lower quality paints than the other ones we've talked about, but they have some awesome metallic colors that I really like. Um, I really only use um, the DecoArt uh, metallics when I'm working with like like Liquitex and things like that, it, just because they're so, the great metallic colors you can get. Another paint I really like a lot is uh, Blick Acrylic um, and Blick Studio. Um, there's a huge art store online, probably the biggest in the world, called Blick, Blick.com. Um, they make a whole lot of different products and they have a brand of a line of Blick Studio acrylics. Here's one. Let me grab this quick. So Blick Studio, um, these are more affordable paints. These are comparable to um, like the Artist Loft paints. Um, oops, yeah, the Artist Loft paints. These are great paints. It's not a huge extensive line of colors, but they're really good. Um, and then they have a cheaper, cheaper than this version of paint called Blick Acrylic, which is more of a lower grade student quality paint but um, you can get bigger containers of that for really good prices. So it's more affordable. So that's great to use if you're just starting out. Um, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money. Um, you could just get a range of uh, simple colors like black, white, um, maybe a couple blues, maybe a, a red, maybe a gold and a silver. Um, you can get you know a set of colors for not a ton of money, but you have a lot of paint to play with. So those just like uh, quickly are the paints I like to use the best. I would stay away from golden um, if you're starting out. Um, I really, I don't use golden that much. Um, they're great, but they're so expensive. So it's like, it's not really worth it for me uh, when all these other paints also are equally as good, gives me uh, good results, as good results in my opinion. Um, you know, golden is higher quality. Yes. Better pigment load. Sure. Um, you can also get the fluid versions, but, um, you're really paying for all that stuff. So, um, and if you're starting out, I would avoid them entirely. Just start out with, with more affordable paints, uh, to get familiar with the techniques and, um, get comfortable with, um, you know, your painting and, and mixing paints and all that stuff. So I hope that helps. Shelly asks, are bloom pores hard? Yes, they are hard. Um, there, uh, there is a lot of things that go into the bloom. Um, I don't want to. I'm not going to go over the whole bloom process, but you need a lot of different ingredients. You have uh, different mixtures of paints. Uh, you got the cell activator. You have to have something called a pillow, which is like a thick layer of paint that you put down first. Um, all the, everything has to be just the right consistency. Um, and you have to blow on the cell activator uh, just right. So you have to use your mouth or a tool um, to spread the cell activator over the other paints. Um, it is a very, very tricky technique. Um, there are some amazing bloom painters out there. Um, Shelly is, you know, she invented the thing, so she's great at it. Um, there are a lot of other ones that I admire a lot. Um, but it is difficult. It's not a uh, piece of cake. It's, it's probably the hardest technique there is, in my opinion, um, just because of all that's involved. And it's also not a cheap technique. There's, you know, you have to invest a lot of money um, in getting all these ingredients. A lot of these things, you have to buy gallons of, you know, paint at a time, which are at minimum $30 each. 
So um, there's a lot involved. And then to add on top of all that, um, if you want to add pigments, well, now we're in a whole nother stratosphere of complexity, uh, difficulty, and cost. So yeah, blooms are, are something, I, I look at it as a completely different type of acrylic paint pouring. It's its own thing. Um, and, but it gets combined and kind of confused and mingled up with all these other techniques. So there is a lot of confusion about blooms and like what's a CA or what's a pillow. And so all these terms get all kind of muddied together with all these other techniques. So, um, but it, yeah, it, it's hard, it's difficult. And then on top of that, in order to get the, you know, the prettiest blooms, in my opinion, you have to use a spinner. So now you have a spinner involved. I mean, there's a lot to it. So yeah, blooms are tough. Um, they're gorgeous and um, people do them amazingly well, but it will take practice and a lot of it to get good at blooms. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I'm just checking out any other questions. Uh, we're going on a long one here tonight. Thanks for sticking with me, everyone. Um, so Michelle asked, and we're, this is going back uh, slightly for a minute, uh, will high quality paints and high quality pouring mediums produce even better results? Not necessarily. Um, in my opinion, um, the, the quality of the paints, the quality of the pouring mediums, quality of your substrates, like your surfaces, is one part of the puzzle. Um, is it an important part? Yes, um, but it is just one part. Um, higher quality ingredients do not necessarily mean better paintings um, because another big important puzzle or piece of the puzzle is what colors you use, um, like your color knowledge, the color harmonies or schemes you're using. Um, that plays a massive role in the quality of your paintings. Um, that's probably the second most important. First most important probably is the right, the correct ratios and proper consistency of your paints. That is probably the most important to ensure um, the best results with your painting. Um, thirdly is, uh, you know, some, you know, and then creating, getting good color palettes together, mixing the paints properly, putting them in the right layer order in your cup or, um, you know, on your canvas, if you're doing like Dutch pours and things, um, technique of pouring your cup. Um, and then one that no one ever talks about when you're talking about flip cups, ring pours, is tilting your painting. So having a good technique um, and being able to tilt your paint correctly and getting a feel and moving your paint around, that's also a huge, um, huge part of a, a good quality painting. So there are a lot of parts to getting a good painting. Quality supplies are uh, one part and they're an important part, but I don't think they are, um, if you had, if you're just starting out and you use the best quality stuff, you're gonna get bad paintings probably um, just because you're new and it's something you haven't done before and you haven't practiced anything. You know, I haven't practiced much. Um, you don't have a feel for the paint. Uh, you're not familiar with your mixing ratios or consistencies. So, you know, obviously um, you're not gonna get the best results right off the bat. Um, but but uh, I will say this, once you're good at, so you, you know your paint consistency, uh, you have great ratios and you're, you can mix them confidently and consistently every time, um, your techniques are good for pouring and layering and tilting. Now, better paints um, and better quality um, pouring mediums and things can just enhance your paintings. Um, I don't think you can, um, I don't think they will take them to like a crazy another level, but they will enhance them and give you like the be better, much better quality. Um, but you have to have the skills to to kind of get them out of that. Does that make sense? I hope so. Again, I'm kind of ranting, um, sorry. But uh, that was a good question though. Um, so yeah, don't feel like you have to, my, I think my whole point is, 
Don't feel like you have to go buy the most expensive stuff because that alone will not give you make you better paintings. Um, so go with the cheaper stuff at the beginning, learn to use it, then you can progress into the more expensive stuff and, and that will help give you some better results. I hope that makes sense. Um, but that's a good, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, okay, so I'm just checking. There's a lot of other questions. Um, we've answered a few of these already. If you haven't, um, um, if you haven't, uh, I'm sorry, you know, you can rewatch the replay. I've answered some of these questions already. Um, well, Angela said she's very comfortable with resin. That's awesome. Then I would go ahead and do it. Um, but again, uh, so I'm happy to hear that, Angela. That makes me very comfortable. Um, but I would still check where it's going to hang, um, and you know, where is it going to live for the life of the painting? Because that will play a big role in um, how people view it. So again, if it's if it's in like there's a lot of light shining in there, maybe take in a test painting just to see what the light will have, like that has resin on it just to see what it'll look like. So, um, you know, resin is gorgeous, um, but, you know, it, it also depends on the environment the painting lives in. So, but that's great. So good luck with that. That's that's gonna be amazing. What a painting. Um, uh, yeah, Donna says, we've got oodles of questions. We sure do. Um, And so I'm just checking through here and see if there's anything else. Let's see. So Donna says she's moved to Liquitex Basics and she loves them. That's awesome to hear, Donna. I love them a lot. Um, Windsor Newton, uh, Novala said Windsor Newton. Those are also great paints. Uh, I haven't used them as much, but those are great too. Yes, there are, are a lot of really good paints out there. These are not, the ones I showed you are not the only ones. There are tons of them. So, um, but uh, there are tons. Uh, Jerry says, um, she hears a lot of uh, good things about Arteza paints. Um, some of them are pre-mixed. I do not love the pre-mixed uh, paints. Um, I've tried them. I do not like really any of them. I like to mix them myself. Uh, it just gives you a much more flexibility in what you add to your paint. The pre-mix stuff, you don't know what's in there um, and you can't control it really. So it, you get what you get, which is fine for like, if you're just starting and want to see if you like this type of painting at all, um, try them out and see if you even like pouring. Um, that's what I would recommend them for. But if you're getting serious about it, I recommend uh, learning to mix your own paints. Um, you just have a whole world of possibilities before you. Um, and Arteza paints are good. I've used a lot of them. Um, I don't recommend them as much just because uh, it's hard to get them sometimes. They run out of stock. So it's very inconsistent with um, getting the Arteza paints. I don't like that. I like to, you know, when I recommend stuff, I like it to be able available, like, you know, on, and on hand so you can get it and use it. And, you know, I've ordered stuff and it's, I've, uh, they've had to refund me because they're out of stock. It's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, so that's, I don't really love Arteza because of that. It's just hard to kind of get their products, but they're pretty good paints. Um, I don't like them as much as Liquitex though. Um, let's see. And Angela says she had a problem. I used an Indian yellow uh, master's touch with Artist Loft iridescent paste medium that completely ruined a canvas. It took about two coats of paint and four coats of kills. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, that's, uh, you're using a different medium, um, like a paste medium or some kind of medium. Um, all these things kind of interact a little bit differently. So yeah, there is some trial and error when you're trying different products. Um, but that's to be expected. You know, a lot of this stuff that we're doing is experimentation. Um, 
and people have never really done this before. You know, you know, this generation over the last few years, no one's ever really done this a lot before. So we're experimenting and finding new things and some things work, some things don't work. Um, some products are very compatible, some are not compatible. So we're always learning new things. And I definitely have not done every single experiment or tried every single product with, with each other. So um, I have done a lot, but now I have not like, um, I haven't done every little thing yet. So bear with me <laughs> on if I, there's something that I, I don't know yet anyway. Uh, um, and Jerry asks if, uh, are you able to show us a bloom painting and the way to go about it one day? One day, yes. Um, uh, I will definitely show you a bloom painting uh, and how to do them perhaps. Um, that is like a whole course in itself though. Um, there are a lot of great videos online doing blooms. Um, Erica Hughes does gorgeous blooms. Um, uh, you could check her out. I mean, she does the whole nine yards. She does everything with spinners and she has a gorgeous um, uh, pigments and everything. I mean, she's fantastic. So, but yes, I will definitely show you my versions of blooms at some point. Um, okay. And, uh, and composition. So Angela's, yeah, comp composition is a kind of a, you know, I'm not going to get into composition here. There are a lot of composition rules I like to follow and they're more guidelines, you know, than rules. Um, acrylic paint pouring in itself, just the nature of it, um, you cannot always accomplish what you're set out to, to do with your composition. But when you have these compositional principles and rules in the back of your mind, it helps when you're tilting and adjusting your paintings. Um, but I'll get into composition down the road a little bit. Um, that's a, a fascinating, I find composition fascinating and uh, I, love, I love talking about it, but not today, not tonight. We're kind of going on a long, long one here, but so we'll try to wrap her up in a little bit. Um, and Noel says, after my cloud pour. So we'll get to them all <laughs> eventually. We will get to them all. There are so many techniques um, that are so much fun to do. All right. And uh, so I'm just checking the, the, the questions. Um, Let's see, anything else? Um, someone asked about Monte Carlo paint. Uh, I'm really not familiar with that brand too much. I've seen it. I do think it's maybe a little, um, it's like a, like more of a, a student grade paint. But um, hey, if that's all you have, go ahead and use it. Um, you know, use what you got. You can't always get all these different products in different parts of the world. So you kind of have to uh, make do with what you can find, what you can use. Um, and, uh, but don't let that deter you, you know, uh, go out. I mean, I'm sure you can find some kind of acrylic paints wherever you are. Um, get them, give them a shot. If you just have water, mix them with the water and give it a try. Um, just use what you can find. Uh, you don't have to have all this other stuff to make good paintings. Um, just mix up some paint, pour it on something and see what happens. Um, and then go from there. Just get started really with what you got. Um, that's my best advice. And uh, let's see, I'm just checking um, other questions. Um, John asked um, if anyone knows products for bloom technique that are available in Europe. Um, and yeah, that's, you know, that again, we're, we're like in venturing into um, places where we can't get all these different products. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure what's in Europe. So um, you'd have to like maybe check out if you can find other YouTube channels that happen to be in Europe, some are close to you, that would be the best resource. Because um, my big problem is I don't know, I'm in the US, but I don't know what's available in Europe or um, I have a friend in Spain and she can't get anything. But, uh, or, you know, I don't know exactly what's available in 
the UK or what's available in um, um, Australia. I know some things in Australia, but it's hard for me to know what products are available all over the place. So, um, but if you can find another painter or someone else doing something similar to what you want to do, it, more located in your area, that would be the best resource to go um, and learn from, or at least ask questions from. So sorry, I can't help you with that, John. Um, well, I think that's it for, I don't see any uh, other questions. Oh, here's one. Um, nope. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, no, I don't see any other questions. There's so many in the comments. You guys are really going crazy with the comments. That's awesome. Um, but uh, and but uh, I don't see any other questions at this point. So I do I have anything else I was going to talk about? We talked about. Uh, I did have a question about the cell activator. Um, I think I answered that hopefully in talking about the Australian Floetrol. Um, I did have another question. I'll talk about this quickly and then we can wrap it up. But it was about greens. And the um, person who asked me said she loves using green in her paintings, but they always turn out looking terrible. Um, so I got some greens out and I just, we're going to give you two, two second chat about green. And green is a funny color because um, it's probably the color we see most in nature, right? Green is everywhere. There's a million shades of green, but most greens out of the paint tubes look unnatural, which is kind of a funny paradox, right? Um, there are a couple greens that I like, um, but getting a green out of a tube that I don't have to alter and have it look good is rare. Um, so like, here's one. This is probably my favorite green. It's a uh, Liquitex Basics Green Gray. Um, it's a very muted kind of, um, not really, it's not really like a olive green, but it's a, just a very pretty grayed down green. I love this color. It's probably my favorite uh, green right out of the tube. The other one that I love is um, this one. I, sh I mentioned it already, DecoArt Metallics. This is Festive Green. It's kind of a goldish, golden green. I love this color. It's just gorgeous. Um, and it does look more natural than a lot of the other greens. Um, but then we have a bunch of, you know, we've got uh, green can go from yellow, yellow green to blue green, and then everywhere in between. But a lot of them look weird out of the tube, like um, lime green. This is a crazy color. It's like, you know, almost fluorescent. It's totally unnatural. Um, that's more of a yellow green. We've got um, like light green. This is also like super saturated green. Looks weird, just right out of the tube. Um, we've got sap green. This is getting a little more closer to a, um, a natural green, but still it's like really powerful. Um, we've got phthalo green, which I almost never use because uh, phthalo green is so powerful. Um, the pigment that it's called us, tinting strength, it's overwhelmingly powerful. And phthalo green kind of just takes over everything. So I, I, I tend to stay away from phthalo green, like completely, and use other greens. Um, then we've got like something like uh, hooker's green. This is, a, um, this is a little more natural green, um, but still it's a very powerful green. Then uh, my third favorite is probably this metallic leaf green from Artist Loft. I love this green, it looks amazing. Um, it's a little more natural, but it's got this awesome metallic sparkle to it. Um, but the, and then we we get into like blue greens. So these are look a little more natural because they're mixed with blue. And that's a, that's a um, hint at what I'm gonna be talking about in a second. So we get into like metallic cobalt blue. This is like a bluish green, like a turquoise. Um, it's a beautiful color. And then we've got um, one of my favorites, bright aqua green. Um, this isn't very natural, but it works really well because it's got more blue in it um, than green. So it, it's, a, it's a bright color, but it doesn't look like weird um, right out of the tube. So like, what do we do with greens to make them look a little more natural? 
Um, I typically don't use greens um, because I, you know, to get these bright green colors, I typically use greens when I'm using more muted colors. Um, but that's me and that's kind of my, my thinking on green. So the way to kind of tone down the greens is to add another, add other colors that you're going to be working with in your painting. So like I typically use um, browns a lot when I'm working with greens, like dark browns. So when I'm mixing up my green, I'll add maybe a little bit of brown into my greens and mix up my greens that way. That, that brings in other colors from your painting and it kind of tones down the green, like the bright green effect. Another thing we can do is add a tiny bit of red to your green paints. And red is the complement of green, like they're across each other on the color wheel. So red is going to kind of gray down your greens a little bit. So it could take, you know, like the light green, like this crazy um, bright light green and make it look a little bit more like the gray green. Um, they won't look exactly the same, but it'll tone down your greens a little bit. So um, that's kind of my two tips for kind of calming down your greens in your painting. Either like mix some other colors that you're working with into your green paint or mix a little bit of red and kind of gray down your um, greens a little bit. Um, and, you know, we can talk about green for a long time, but those are, and then also you could add a tiny bit of white and adding a tiny bit of white to your greens will lighten them a little bit and also cool them down. So it'll be a little lighter and a little cooler. Um, and there's a lot like, you know, the bright aqua green, there's a lot of white in this green as well as blue. So that's a little couple tips about working with greens. Um, I, I typically, I typically don't do a lot of green paintings. And when I do, uh, use green a lot, I usually, uh, tend to use them more towards the blue side or again, like more of a natural color, like, um, with earth tones and more, um, grayed down greens. So anyway, that's how I use them. So, but, um, I hope that, uh, I think that'll wrap it up. Um, we've gone on for a long time on this one, but thank you so much for joining me tonight. I hope I answered a whole lot of your questions. You had a great questions and, uh, um, Hope that helped. If you missed the beginning part, there's a whole lot of stuff in the replay at the beginning of our live stream. So you can feel free to go back and watch um, the first part if you just came in later. So thanks so much everyone for joining me. Um, let me post this again uh, really quickly. And um, this is uh, my link to my Amazon page. Um, so a lot of the stuff we talked about uh, are on that page, on my Amazon page. So for your reference, like I think I have a, like a page on pouring mediums. I have a page on all like my framing supplies. Um, I've got a page on just like uh, essential supplies. There's a whole lot of stuff in there. Not necessarily so you can go buy it from my page, but it shows you what I use, and um, so you could go check it out and see exactly the things I like to use if you want to are interested in using what I like. So um, hopefully that helps, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next live, which will be Friday, I think, and maybe we'll do a demo painting. We'll see, and uh, I'm not going to give it away yet. We'll I'll play it by ear and see what kind of technique we'll, we'll be working with. Um, but hopefully it'll be a whole lot of fun. So take care, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Great questions. And, uh, thanks for sticking around. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.